Hello, I'm um, Crystal Parikh, and I am the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at New York University. And it's my um, great pleasure to welcome you here tonight um, for our panel discussion and celebration of Monica Kim's The Interrogation Rooms of the Korean War, The Untold History. Before we begin, I would like us to take a moment to acknowledge that we are gathered here on unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would like also like to recognize that New York City is currently home to approximately 100,000 people who identify as indigenous, including many people from the Pacific. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. So um, I wanted to say a word about Monica's book in relationship to the larger programming um, agenda we have for this year at the Institute. We did want to actually celebrate Monica's book last spring when it was first released, but because of scheduling conflicts, we decided to wait until this moment in the fall. And in many ways, this has proven fortuitous for the Institute, whose thematic focus for this academic year is in the wake of war. And the interrogation rooms of the Korean War is a perfect fit for this theme, if also devastatingly so, in terms of its stakes and implications. The so-called forgotten war, she argues, um, shifted the very subject of war from one of territory to the individual human, thus forcing the world to grapple with who it is that inhabits such humanity. And our panelists will, of course, um, unpack the claims of Monica's book for us in much more detailed ways. So I just want to take a moment to observe that inter the interrogation rooms of the Korean War is a book that attests to both the modesty and grace that are completely characteristic of Monica, if you know her. Um, but it's also a brilliant work. And I'm so delighted that this is the first work of scholarship the Institute is celebrating this academic year. Also, our programming this year includes um, work with our artist in residence, Ocean Fuang, and I think many of you joined us last um, week for this, uh, the, the launch of his residency, um, as well as a symposium on November 1st, um, citing APA studies, a celebration of scholars, and the po uh, panel discussion, Imperial Entanglements, Permanent Conditions of War in the Pacific on December 5th. So we hope you all join us for those events as well. Um, to stay updated on these and other APA Institute activities, follow us on social media at APA Institute on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and consider joining, uh, signing to, up to receive our newsletter, which you can do at the website, apa.nyu.edu, or at the registration table um, on your way out. Um, we'd also like to thank the co-sponsors of tonight's event for their generous support. These are the NYU Department of History, NYU Department of East Asian Studies, and NOTUTEL for Korean Community Development. And I am, as always, grateful to the staff of the APA Student Institute, whose hard work made this program possible. So our format for this evening will, um, is as follows. Um, uh, we'll have a set of remarks and presentations, um, then followed by a roundtable discussion, followed by reception and book signing. And books are available for purchase via the NYU bookstore uh, table out in the lobby as well. And um, you will find full biographies of our numerous and accomplished um, speakers from this evening. So I'm going to be keeping the bios short when I introduce them. Uh, but you can also find those um, in the program. The, much more extended ones. So um, without further delay, um, our first speaker is Min Bei, who will offer remarks on ha behalf of Nodutel. She is a PhD candidate in the History Department at Temple University and a fellow at the Center for Engaged Scholarship. Her work looks at the history of labor organizing in New York's Asian communities. And she is also a member of Nodutel for Korean Community Development, which is co-sponsoring tonight's program. Please welcome Min -Ju. First, I'd like to th uh, start by thanking the organizers and to everyone at the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU, and also to Professor Monica Kim for thinking of us and the opportunity to briefly dis discuss Nodutor's organizing as it relates to Korea. So Nodutor is a multi-generational organization of diasporic Koreans, and we w work towards peace and people-centered reunification here and abroad. For us, the penultimate sentence of Professor Kim's book resonates. She writes, the Korean War is a war that is simultaneously everywhere and nowhere, end quote. This is Nodutor's central tension. We struggle with the wars everywhere and nowhereness. We're still dismantling the interrogation rooms that judge whether we are the good or bad Koreans. And instead, we're building around our common experiences of war and division on the peninsula, in our families, and on the streets. I'll highlight some of our recent and near future campaigns. The first is the peace treaty campaign. Nodutor supports House Resolution 152, which would formally end the Korean War. 
What our ambitions are in a people-centered reunification. We're fighting for the reunion of separated families, open borders, and the demilitarization of the Asia Pacific, which would include the US's removal of weapons in the region. Lodo Third hosts teach-ins, book talks, participates in rallies and other political actions, and works in solidarity with those who are also struggling against militarism, colonial rule, policing, family separation, and borders. For example, we marched and drummed at the Trans Day of Action because self-determination is also queer liberation. And recently, we collaborated with Decolonize This Place at the Whitney Museum alongside other anti-militarism and police abolition activists to contribute to dismantling police and military hegemony globally. 2020 marks the 70th year since the fighting that broke out before the official beginning of the Korean War. It also, it is also the 40th anniversary of the Gwangju Uprising, a civilian massacre that occurred to suppress leftist student-led demonstrations in 1980. So 2020 will be an intense year for us. The Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference, which occurs every five years at the United Nations, will take place in April 2020. It will be an opportunity to hold the US accountable and demand reparations for Korean survivors of the atomic bombs. And finally, in our devotion to create peace-informed connections among communities, we have hosted and gone on delegations to North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and Hawaii, to future delegations to Cuba, and these are ways for us to make relationships, come together around a collective dream, and build our imagined futures. If you'd like to plug in and get connected with us, um, I'll be sticking around, uh, or you can connect with us on social media. We're on every outlet. Um, thank you, and many congratulations to our comrade, Professor Monica Kim. Next, we'll be hearing from Marie Myung Oak Lee. Um, she is an acclaimed Korean American writer and author of, no of the novel Somebody's Daughter, published in 2016 by Beacon Press. And her next novel, um, The Evening Hero, from which she will read, is forthcoming with Simon and Schuster. Please welcome Marie. I'm really happy to be in this space um, to celebrate this amazing book. And um, so, in in the introduction to the interrogation rooms of the Korean War, um, Monica Kim so succinctly but profoundly writes, to tell a story about war is to tell a story about humanity. She documents in, um, incidences throughout her marvelous book where soldiers, especially POWs, are struggling to make themselves be seen as human. As a novelist of color, I feel that this is my ultimate artistic goal as well to take set war narratives. North Korea is evil, South Korea is good, Korea has always been magically separated into North and South by the 38th parallel, to burst these tropes to break out the individual human story. So I'm gonna read a br um, brief excerpt from my forthcoming novel, The Evening Hero, which is set both in Minnesota and in fictional water project village in Kaesong, which is once had an informal peace zone during the war. And I was actually able to visit it very briefly on a trip to North Korea in 2009, um, as it has a curious history of being located below the 38th parallel, um, i.e. in South Korea since 1945, but it was given over to North Korea um, after the armistice in 1953. On July 27th, when the armistice was declared, a great shout of joy went up around Water Project Village. Industrious Koreans had constructed the truce building in 48 hours. The two sides met at what both sides agreed to call Panmunjom to ensure a complete cessation of hostilities and of all acts of armed force in Korea. The villagers thought this meant peace. But more and more American soldiers patrolled the exchange zone market, their mouths set. The Korean soldiers, north, south, south, north, stopped holding hands and strolling arm in arm. Water Project Village sat, safely, they thought, a good hundred kilometers below the 38th parallel. The famous bay where MacArthur made his Incheon landing was within their sights. Their accents were good, mid-peninsula people. If anything, the people of this region had much more in common with the southern hicks of Cholanamdo, but none of their tolerance for communist ideas. 
Young man's mother's face whitened the day the ROK and the US military started pounding signs into posts around the exchange zone market, warning that the market was no longer, and this was the site of something called military demarcation line. ROK soldiers with bullhorns read from scripts. There will be no occupancy two kilometers to the north and south of this line. They were going to fence it off and seed it with mines. It would be in no man's land. They had 48 hours to decide whether to evacuate south to Seoul or stay in the Gold County. Anyone who chose to stay and become a northerner, however, would be brought in for interrogation as to their reason why. Their neighbor, a Catholic priest, started yelling, you can't do this, you can't make us leave our home. He kept yelling, he told people not to leave. He said the Americans had not only dropped that white powder containing sickness from the sky, that they had other weapons, that they were experimenting putting their germs in, insects, in bullets. They had plans to put germs in the town well to kill anyone who stayed behind. He yelled so much, so military police were eventually called in to bind his arms and gag him. Even still, you could see his red face, his wild eyes. They led him away to where no one knew. Yongman's mother brought their few saleable belongings to the exchange zone market, which itself was dissolving under their feet. Shu Auntie kissed them all and cried and handed Yongman and Yongshik each a pair of brand new gomoshim. She and her new husband were going to go far away, but where, she didn't say. She had spoken previously of relatives in Manchuria. Yongman hadn't considered that one could leave Korea altogether, maybe forever. Most of the other vendors had already vacated. It was amazing to Yongman to think there were ever soldiers of North and South mingling here, playing shuttlecock like boys, laughing in the sun, eating fried silkworm larvae from newspaper cones as if at any market in any place in Korea at any time. The grasses, tamped down from the tarps and other makeshift floors, were already springing back and greening. Yongman's mother managed to sell their father's agronomy books. Yongman was also surprised to see his mother unwrap the celadon vase, all gentle curves, the pale green ringed with a lovely design of a few lonely clouds and white cranes, the slender-legged birds that flew with their feet gracefully extended. Haraboji would show them how, when you turn the vase in your hands, the cranes circled endlessly. The vase even had a thread of gold that followed a hairline crack that traversed its length, where you couldn't tell if the vase had been broken, then repaired with a golden solder, or if that lightning-shaped crack was part of the design. It was a present a magistrate had given their great-grandfather during the Chosun dynasty for his tenure as a civil servant. Yongman didn't know why their mother wouldn't bring such a valuable piece to Seoul with them. The same way she had carefully packed her father's, his father's silver chopsticks and spoon, or Yongman's microscope, which his father had purchased for him at what must have been an unthinkable sum shortly before he'd been arrested for the second time. A lazy-eyed American man bought the vase Young Man saw he recognized how it was quite valuable and old, even though he only gave his mother half of what, what she asked. She did not look back, even though Young Man did, seething. She had one more errand. She slipped into a stall where she exchanged all her wan for a gold ring, fat and heavy on her finger. Thank you. Um, so next we'll be hearing from the person of the hour herself, uh, Monica Kim. So Monica Kim is assistant professor in US and world history in the Department of History at NYU. Her book, The Interrogation Room of the Korean War, The Untold History, which we are celebrating tonight, which is uh, released earlier this year by Princeton University Press, and it's a trans-Pacific history of decolonization excuse me, decolonization told through the experiences of two generations of people creating and navigating military interrogation rooms of the Korean War. Her research and writing have been supported by fellowships from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the Penn Humanities Forum at the University of Pennsylvania, and the Korea Foundation. Uh, Monica Kim has worked um, with critical scholars in US and South Korea around political and pedagogical interventions aimed at challenging the escalating militarism in the ongoing Korean War. Please welcome Monica. <laughs> 
Well, I want to thank um, APA Institute, Department of History, Department of East Asian Studies, Nudutol for um, for coming together and supporting this event. It also, I think, really reflects, um, and also Department of History, um, it really reflects um, kind of my own interdisciplinary place um, in uh, approaching writing this history of the Korean War. I also want to thank APA Institute for um, putting together, I think this is really remarkable to have a panel of all women um, who are talking about militarization. <laughs> And not just all women, but we are talking about artists, cultural producers, scholars, and journalists. And so I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation today. Another thing that really, after having given a few talks on the book, I'm realizing that this space is, uh, is very singular and exceptional for me because in this space, I'm not only a historian and a writer, I'm also someone's daughter. I'm someone's sister, I'm a friend, a colleague, um, I'm also someone's advisee. I'm sure my graduate students will want to speak with you, Penny. <laughs> I see former students, current and former students, undergrad, um, and so just thank you so much um, and really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. So with this book, um, the the story of the Korean War, as um, Minju and also Marie in different ways have already put out for us, it's often told as a, st a story of a war that began in 1950 and ended in 1953. And this kind of story really relies on the 30th parallel as the pivot point for much of its development. As a result, the 30th parallel, a border imposed in 1950. 45, essentially by the U.S. after the Japanese surrender, becomes more and more naturalized with each telling of the Korean War in the United States. Now, as Minju had mentioned, the 70th year of the Korean War is next year in 2020. The Korean War never officially ended. It was the signing of a ceasefire in 1953, which Marie had mentioned, that has held outright physical conflict in abeyance on the peninsula. For me, as a historian and a writer, the unending and ongoing nature of the Korean War presents a fundamental political question for my project. How does one write a history of a war that has not ended? Or to be more to the point, how do I write a history of a war in a way that points to and insists upon noticing how this war has not ended? I begin my story of the Korean War inside the interrogation room because such a move undermines and explodes two hallmark elements of how the stories of US imperial warfare are told, that they are exceptional and that they happen over there. So really, the, by starting in the interrogation room for me, I realized that this was actually a way to talk about how the war is a structuring of the everyday and is embedded in the everyday. So even in thinking about an end to the Korean War, there's no way that we can simply be, quote unquote, focusing on the 30th parallel, for example. So the interrogation rooms in my book are ordinary, they are everyday, they are improvised, or they can even be highly ritualized. So take, for example, the story of a Korean peasant farmer named Chang Chun Sum, whose home and rice paddy fields were supposedly along the 30th parallel. So I came across this interrogation report. Um, it was dated April 1946. And um, peasant farmer Chang um, is being visited by South Korean and US military interrogators. And the reason why they're visiting him is because he has um, a home and a rice paddy field that's located somewhere inside the 30th parallel. But it was one particular detail about his home that they wanted to talk to him about, which is that he had a trilingual sign on his home. And it was in Russian, English, and Korean. And it said, beyond this home is South Korea which raised the question, well, is the home, is it in South Korea or is it not in South Korea? And this caused a lot of anxiety for interrogator, interrogators from both sides of the parallel. And I just thought that this sign was just absolutely brilliant because it shows that um, ordinary non-elite people like a Korean peasant farmer 
we're already understanding and navigating global geopolitics. And this is where I wanted to begin my story of the Korean War. Because to start um, a story of the Korean War with someone like Chang Chung Sum in April, 40, April 1946, is to tell the story of the war as one about decolonization. So in 1945, we have Korean liberation from Japanese colonial rule. So what did liberation, power, loss, and negotiation look like on the ground? Chang was negotiating on the ground to keep access to his livelihood, his land, and he did not trust the foreign occupation powers. Now, the interrogation report also itself, when we look at it, functions similarly to the maps of the Korean War. The US military report here represents itself as an already coherent piece of bureaucratic documentation. It's visually self-contained, and we can take the narrative template for granted. We know what to expect and what to seek out, and it appears to be rather straightforward. But for me, after reading through these documents, and actually this particular archive of um, US counterintelligence core documents of um, US military occupation, they, they remain kind of foundational um, still to the historiography. Now, this is what I noticed. I was so focused on the content and the narrative that I wasn't noticing the name of the interrogator. And the name of the interrogator on this report is George Yamamoto. So, for me, in that moment, I was asking myself, who the hell is George Yamamoto? And what is he doing in the interrogation rooms of the Korean War? And that's when I realized I was taking so many things for granted, just as we might take the 30th parallel for granted. I didn't know what languages were actually being spoken in the interrogation room, and I didn't even know how many people might have been in that room. So, after more research, um, and also the uh, generosity of different oral history communities um, I worked with and different war veterans organizations, I was finally able to map out this story. 4,000 Japanese Americans were drafted by the US military, or they volunteered, to serve as interrogators during the Korean War because there was a dearth of Korean Americans in the United States at that time due to As Asian and Chinese exclusion acts dating back to the 1880s. So the US military, because um, they needed interrogators and they needed that labor, they basically reasoned that because Koreans had been under Japanese colonial rule for the first half of the 20th century, surely they would be able to be interrogated in Japanese. Um, now, if we were to kind of pause a bit and also think about the interrogators themselves, someone like Sam Miyamoto. Um, Sam Miyamoto, uh, he had been, um, well, he was 18 years old um, when he was drafted to serve as an interrogator during the Korean War. And if you think um, ab that about these young men who were drafted to be interrogators, if they were 18 or 19 years old, that means five years previous, they themselves had been adolescents behind barbed wire fences in the internment camps of World War II. So the Japanese American interrogators of the Korean War had themselves been incarcerated only five years previously. And what's very important is that, um, so Sam Miyamoto and I, I, um, I had done a few different oral history uh, interviews with him. He told me that when, so he had been himself in, in the concentration camp in Poston, Arizona, and he was born in Brawley, California. When he was in the Korean War, um, he told me that Korean communist POWs would actually usually spit on the floor before they entered the interrogation room, which was a clear remark of, we do not recognize your authority. However, when they saw him, they didn't spit, according to Sam Miyamoto. They actually wanted to ask him a question. And the question they wanted to ask him was, why aren't you fighting with us? Your government put you behind barbed wire fence. You were in a concentration camp. And he, had, he told me that he told them, and I thought this was quite extraordinary, kind of like the trilingual sign of Chang, I told him the truth. I said, I'm here because I was ordered to come here. I didn't come here by choice. I was ordered to join the army, and I was ordered to study the Korean language, and I was ordered to come here and talk to you about this. So between, um, between Sam Miyamoto and, uh, and somebody like the Korean peasant Chang, something very basic gets unsettled. We often think 
think of interrogation as singular events. Although anyone who is more familiar either politically or personally with police and carceral systems will tell you that interrogation is a landscape. Both Miyamoto, the Japanese American interrogator, and Chang, the Korean peasant, understood that they had to be interrogated themselves over and over and over again. Or as the projects of state and empire building shifted over time, their own subjecthood would be refashioned, or as in the case of Sam Miyamoto, for another war. So basically, the temporal and the geopolitical kind of frames of the Korean War have to shift when we look at at it from the vantage point of inside the interrogation room. So the exceptional Cold War story of the US must be placed into the longer histories about struggles over decolonization, race, and empire building. But my book is not simply about these landscapes of war. The interrogation room itself became a global political flashpoint during the Korean War. So what happens in January of 1952 at the armistice negotiating tables at Panmunjom So um, in January 1952, everything else on the agenda for the negotiations um, had been settled, including where the ceasefire line was going to be. But what happens is that the US representatives uh, for the United Nations Command comes in after basically their kind of winter break and says, uh, we have a proposal for something called voluntary repatriation. And according to this proposal, the Korean and Chinese POWs under UNC custody would be free to quote unquote choose whether or not they wanted to return to their homeland. The US military interrogation room, as both the US delegate and the Truman administration um, insisted, they actually called it a space of free will. So the delegates of North Korea and China, as you can imagine, quickly pointed to the fact that the 1949 Geneva Conventions on the Treatment of Prisoners of War called for mandatory repatriation. So they're like, wait a moment. <laughs> we, this, we, we're, we're pushing back on this. So this controversy over POW repatriation would delay the signing of the ceasefire for another 18 months, an important detail often overlooked in the histories of the Korean War. So in my book, I argue that there is a fundamental shift in the character of the Korean War at the beginning of 1952 with the US government's introduction of the voluntary POW repatriation proposal, where the Korean War effectively shifted from being waged over the violation of a border, the 38th parallel, to being waged over the violation of the individual subject, the prisoner of war. So the war moves from a preoccupation with territory to being a contestation over human interiority. And then suddenly, every state and every organization was claiming to have the interrogation room that best exemplified democratic or liberatory ideals. So as the interrogation room came under scrutiny, the nature of the encounter in these spaces became a measure of the respective state's legitimacy and its claims or challenges to the ideals of liberal governance. The POW controversy of the Korean War touched off a constellation of political anxieties and ambitions because it resonated with the very basic problematic confronting the decolonizing world. Which state could reinvent the most intimate relations of the colonizer and the colonized to transform the relationship between the state and the subject into one of liberation, democracy, or empire? So, Essentially, my book reveals or traces how the global visions of US Secretary of State Dean Atchison, Indian President Nehru, South Korean President Syngman Rhee, or North Korean Premier Kim Il-sung were contingent upon thousands of acts of interrogation, translation, and disciplining of possible subjects. So that the interrogation room, in effect, is not there to produce quote unquote information. It was actually supposed to produce subjects. So the book opens up with Japanese American internment and the US military occupation of South Korea. It then follows 4,000 Japanese Americans to Korea where they served as interrogators during the Korean War. It then traces the post-war journeys of Korean POWs shipped by the United Nations and Indian military to India, Brazil, Argentina. And then finally maps out the movements of American POWs through the interrogation networks within Chinese and North Korean POW camps. So, by attempting to write a rather 
what I consider to be an intimate history of the Korean War, I found myself writing also a very global history of the war framed by the stakes of decolonization. So this controversy over interrogation rooms was ultimately a heated international debate over who gets to engage in war. War, we must remember, was a privilege accorded to only recognized states. Only sovereign entities could engage in what Clausewitz has famously conceptualized as a duel, a legitimate extension of policymaking involving two recognizable states. I argue in my book that the post-1945 forms of regulating warfare were, in fact, the regulation of political sovereign recognition in an era of formal decolonization. And basically, nowhere was this issue of political recognition laid more bare than during the Korean War. So the Korean War was not officially a war, according to the Truman administration. It was dubbed a police action by the United Nations. And then even having the United Nations as an official belligerent already blows up this idea of you know, equal sovereign states being involved in war because the United Nations, which is clearly not a nation state, um, was an official belligerent. And the UN actually would not um, uh, become an official belligerent again until the first Gulf War. And then as for China and North Korea, the UN did not recognize either state as sovereign entities. So to define what was legitimate warfare was to define who was a legitimate state in this situation. Now, I want to show you um, an example of a highly formalized template of the interrogation room. And I'm going to show you some of these schematic drawings of the explanation rooms created by the Indian-led Neutral Nations Repatriation Committee. And so this is another story of the Korean War that is often elided or rendered invisible, which is that India was actually um, the entity who broke the impasse at the armistice negotiation tables. Because India said, OK, how about we offer a quote unquote third choice to POWs, and that they can choose to go to a so-called neutral country. And I, I believe that um, in US and South Korean historiography, this has really been pushed to the side um, in terms of a much more anti-communist agenda because these explanation rooms, as you, you will see, really are kind of like an early expression, let's say, of non-alignment politics. So if you look here, and I'm going to zoom in on, so this is the whole schema for how at the 30th parallel in what they called the Indian village, POWs would be able to go through these explanation rooms and choose, um, and the, the Indian custodian forces were saying that their setup um, was actually better for uh, the Korean POWs than what the US military had set up. And if you look at this, um, can't quite go over there, but um, there are on the left-hand side um, towards the top, there are chairs, and that's um, different delegates from the Neutral Nations um, Repatriation Committee who would be there. So you would have somebody from India, Switzerland, Sweden, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. And then it, right here where it says explainers, so for example, if you have a South Korean POW who is actually deciding to go to North Korea, at the explainer's table would be somebody who's a representative from the South Korean government who is charged with explaining to the South Korean POW why they should remain. And the POW would be seated on that bench. And then on uh, that other bench, you have even more um, observers of this. You can see that um, at the very top, that's the exit for repatriation. And then the bottom one is for non-repatriation. So the kind of formalized, um, almost allegorical kind of scene of interrogation here really shows how interrogation in this moment during the Korean War is being freighted with um, a, a kind of playing out of global geopolitics at the most intimate level. Now, with all of these uh, formal, let's say, interrogation rooms, and I, I do hope to convey that the US military interrogation rooms were definitely not necessarily formal at all, However, it, what was very important for me also in writing this book was to show um, kind of what I was calling an entire ecosystem of violence, bureaucracy, and intimacy. So you would have formal interrogation rooms, let's say like the US military 
or the Indian explanation rooms, but then you would have an entire, let's say, informal system of interrogation set up by South Korean paramilitary youth groups. And why this is very, very important to note is that um, the South Korean paramilitary youth groups who were present in the POW camps of the Korean War, they call themselves the Anti-Communist Youth League. Um, through my research, I then found out that the, um, that the Northwest uh, Young Men's Association, uh, which was a very notorious um, youth group uh, during U.S. military occupation, they were they're notorious because historians and journalists have noted their basically the br brutal tactics um, and being responsible for a lot of the mass violence and civilian massacres, especially on Jeju Island during the U.S. military occupation. So through my research, what I realized was that the U.S. counterintelligence core was absolutely dependent and reliant on a Northwest Young Men's Association. And not only that, but the ACYL, which is the um, anti-communist youth league that is created in the POW camps, they are a continuation of that exact youth group. And you even have people who are still members from that. And that's important to note because um, for example, with um, the ACYL and also the um, Northwest Young Men's Association, they've often been dismissed as, you know, being thugs, et cetera, et cetera, um, by historians. When I came across their tattooing practices that they were incorporating into their interrogation rooms, I that to me these these tattooing practices, for example. Um, they're a political practice. It's a really compressed way of um, disciplining subjects, obviously, but also, um, at least in my book, I talk about when the tattooing practices happen, and it always happens vis-a-vis -vis the other military interrogation rooms that are, that are happening, and it's a way for the South Korean um, paramilitary youth groups in a way to claim a kind of sovereignty, um, even within the POW camp, but that's also happening um, with the aid of the U.S. Counterintelligence Corps. For other informal networks that are happening across the peninsula, um, the, I want to take us now to the North Korean and Chinese POW camps of the Korean War. And what happens there is, um, well, the ironic thing about the Korean War is that within the U.S. public imagination about this forgotten war in the U.S., um, everyone remembers the Manchurian candidate, or at least the trope of brainwashing. And it really comes out of this moment. And um, for the U.S. military psychiatrists, when they're evaluating U.S. POWs who are returning from North Korean and Chinese camps, they are um, really troubled by, um, for example, 21 U.S. POWs who actually decide not to return to the U.S. and they decide to stay in China. And they ultimately use this uh, diagnosis of brainwashing to basically dismiss what I discover as um, a kind of internationalist politics that are being offered by uh, North Korean, especially North Korean interrogators um, in these POW camps. What was very, I think this kind of brings us home, I guess, um, the U.S. military psychiatrists also say that um, there is one group that was not brainwashed and maintained their American nationalism and identity, and it was the Ku Klux Klan. So what ends up happening is that um, in the North Korean and Chinese POW camps, um, white ethnic uh, POWs create their own kind of kind of similar to the South Korean paramilitary youth groups, they're creating their own kind of informal system of interrogation. And it is the KKK that gets reinstituted re here at near the Yalu River. And, um, and that's the way that I wanted to show um, that, in a sense, Jim Crow America is also present near the Yalu River in the Korean War. So with this kind of positioning of the ongoing war um, via the interrogation room, I'm really trying to insert it back into the everyday, into something that is trans-Pacific, um, that implicates both, uh, both sides of um, the hemisphere in the Pacific. And um, I look forward to hearing the comments.
So we will be hearing from Crystal Manhee Pick, who is an assistant professor of gender and sexuality studies at the University of California, Riverside. Her forthcoming book, Reencounters um, on the Korean War and Diaspora, a Diasporic Memory um, Critique, is forthcoming with um, Temple University Press in 2019. And it draws on a selection of diasporic cultural memory practices to track the conflicting meanings of true justice in relation to true justice um, to in relation to American militarized presence in Korea and the North Pacific. Naoko Shubu Sawa is an associate professor of history and associate professor of American studies and ethnic studies at Brown University. In addition to her first book, America's Geisha Ally, Reimagining the Japanese Enemy, which was published in 2006 by Harvard University Press. She has published on transnational Asian American identities, Cold War ideologies, the Lavender Scare, and the Kinsey Report. Joan Scott is Professor Emeritus in the School of, Sci of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study. Scott's recent book, um, books have focused on the vexed relationship of the particularity of gender to the universalizing force of democratic politics. They include Sex and Secularism, uh, published by Princeton University Press in 2017, and Knowledge, Power, and Academic Freedom, published in 2018 by Columbia University Press. And E. Tammy Kim, who will be moderating our discussion um, this evening, is a freelance magazine reporter, contributing opinion writer at the New York Times, and former, le formal, excuse me, former legal services attorney. She covers the Korea's economics, labor, and arts, and culture for outlets, including the New York Book Review, uh, Review of Books, The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and The Nation. Please welcome all of our panelists this evening. Um, so while published this past year, um, Professor Kim's book has already reshifted how scholars in American studies engage the implications of the Korean War, especially as a prolonged conflict that has had significant repercussions for how and why war is fought um, in the here and now. Um, so for my, my comments for Professor Kim, they'll be formulated through questions. And I'm inviting Professor Kim and really the panelists um, to respond, and also the audience, um, to respond in any, um, to any or all the questions as they resonate with you. Um, so before I segue into these questions, I just want to share a very brief quotation from a talk that was given by um, Solmaz Sharif at Harvard University in October 2018. So Sharif is a poet um, whose first collection of poems, Look, I think is very much in conversation um, with our discussion today. So she notes, I have always been obsessed with state-sponsored language and how a violence against the body is premeditated by the violence against language and how that intersects with the role of the poet as a caretaker of language, if nothing else, and what it means for the language of the state to reckon with the language of the lyric." Unquote. Um, so while Professor Kim might um, describe herself as an interdisciplinary scholar as well as a historian rather than a poet per se, and while her book is a historical text rather than a book of poetry, I would dare say that the poignancy, the clarity, and the conviction of her prose communicates a deep ethical care and a potent lyricism that then forces the U.S. state to reckon with the violence that underlies its militarized governance. To be sure, militarized governance is not just about the enacting of brutal physical violence against bodies, but also about how such acts then dovetail with and are undergirded by a process of writing, as Professor Kim noted um, in her talk, um, indicative of subject making. Um, so with that said, um, these are the three questions that I have for you. So the first concerns writing. Um, so I'm run wondering if you could discuss your process of writing this book not only as a text that centers historical subjects who, through a myriad of micro gestures as well as larger collective efforts, resisted or challenged U.S. governmentality, but also your own writing as an intentional practice of refusal, especially in the context of paper militarism. So I just want to offer two entry points to engage this question. Um, first, um, you know, you're really careful in strategic narration of structural violence through the nuanced perspectives of historical subjects who experience but also meted out violence in the interrogation room. And I think your writing is really able to hold um, complex, if not messy, subjectivities in ways that then reject the U.S. state's attempt to neatly contain and script PO subjectivity through this narrative of 
American humanitarianism, liberal progress, and resolution. And sort of a second point of entry, you know, thinking as scholars, um, you know, our writing is marked by intentional choices regarding how we write and who and what we write about. But at the same time, I'm also wondering about the choices that we make regarding what perhaps we choose not to write about, what we refuse to write about, and also perhaps even evacuate from the text. So I'm just wondering about this relationship between presence and absence in your writing. So the second question that I have um, for you is intimacy, which you mentioned a few times in your talk, and really um, Cold War geopolitical in, um, intimacy. So in the beginning of your book on page three, you powerfully describe how, quote, stories of war hold allegorical power because at their most fundamental, they are stories about intimate encounter, unquote. So intimacy emerges, again, as such a key thematic throughout your book. So here, of course, I'm referring to intimacy not as a kind of romantic love, but really as a mode of relationality through which seemingly um, individuated proximities that then occur in enclosed spaces. So for instance, the encounters between POWs and their interrogators are actually reflective of and then mediated through a broader set of geopolitical desires and structural power differentials. So I'm wondering then if you can speak a little bit more to this kind of geopolitical intimacy and perhaps more specifically, how your work then moves us toward um, a theorization of Cold War relationality that's very much in conversation with, but I think also distinct um, from existing paradigms um, that um, really focus on a kind of affective politics of gratitude, of benevolent um, integration, of assimilation that then binds the racialized gendered subject to the US state. So for instance, I'm thinking about um, Christina Klein's concept of Cold War Orientalism, in which the US state then sought to assimilate Asiatics um, into a kind of middle class white American milieu through a kind of sentimental discourse of love and integration. And my third and final question for you is um, concerning the diaspora of an unended war. Um, so your book just um, ends with such um, a powerful and sobering discussion of the unended Korean War, not only through its kind of emotional and psychic residues, which of course are so important um, to consider, but also through very material social and political repercussions that then continue to structure lives in unforgettable and undeniable ways, right there, sort of mundane and everyday as well. Um, so I'm wondering um, how your, might, your work might help us to revisit, reckon with, and rethink the terms that are then commonly used to language and frame the now 70-year Korean War, especially in Asian American studies, I think, um, in proximity to the past, so terms like post-memory or hauntings. So while foregrounding the potency, um, necessity, and power of these concepts, especially when we think about how they destabilize or queer our very understanding of linear progressive time, I'm also wondering if they perhaps capture the kind of contemporary state of the Korean War in the 21st century, a shape-shifting, volatile conflict characterized by militarized division, the threat of nuclear warfare, and the continued separation of families, as well as bureaucratic, administrative, and cultural elements that are visible to the naked eye, but perhaps are initially difficult to diagnose as byproducts of war. So it can be said that Americans, even American scholars, have ignored or overlooked the Korean War, that it was a seemingly short-lived episode between the end of World War II and the war in Vietnam. But uh, most of us are realizing, and Monica's very wonderful book are help, help, is helping us realize even more so, is that the Korean War needs to be seen as a watershed moment. This civil war in a decolonizing country expanded into a much larger struggle that put into motion or intensified a number of dynamics that have characterized capitalist alignment under the ages of US empire. By examining the Korean War, we can see the origins of the global military industrial complex that not only saved capitalism, but also extended and intensified it. As Monica reminds us, the Cold War was crucial in justifying NSC 68, in so doing, it extended the war economy that brought the U.S. out of the Great Depression and made it permanent through the military industrial complex. She also reminds us that the war was a gift from the gods, according to the Japanese capitalists, and by extension, the U.S. project to make Japan a model capitalist nation in East Asia.
And as Patrick Chung argues, it was the Korean War, it was during the Korean War, that the U.S. military built the infrastructure and gave up the contracts essential for the growth of the Korean capitalist economy. Indeed, he suggests that the world's, as the large, world's largest consumer and contractor, the U.S. military needs to be further examined for its role in shaping the modern capitalist economy. So Professor Kim, I'm calling her Monica, I'm being a little casual here, sorry, <laughs> um, brings into the conversation a wholly new dimension that shows us how, as she says, the official warfare moved from being waged over geopolitical territory into being waged over human interiority. Indeed, as she shows us, some U.S. officials even characterize human interiority as some sort of new frontier without being conscious of the metaphor that it did tap into the larger imperial goals that they de denied. And this is probably because Americans don't really know what the difference between colonialism and imperialism, and maybe they can't be blamed because not even Hart and Negri got that straight either. So <laughs> anyways, why did this happen? How did this happen, this, this transfer, right, to the interiority? She convincingly shows us that individual responses to what are you, what do you, what do you support became crucial in the endeavor for legitimacy in the period of decolonization. Interrogation's words, as she tells us, not just about extracting information, but about persuading to produce desired outcomes, that is the vindication of a geopolitical stance, whether it be a free market, capitalist society, communist, or neutral. The POW then was a litmus test that could vindicate the position by their choice, supposedly freely choosing what they were. Uh, so POWs and other conflicts are different it's in, in kind of slightly different ways, right? They marked like, you know, mercy or recognition of humanity. They served as objects for negotiation, for exchange, or for Native Americans. Prisoners even became tribal members, um, replenishing members who had been killed or died. But in this new configuration that Monica Kim talks about is an emphasis on choice of the POW. And we can see why then the Japanese Americans, as a liberal subject, was so important to the American case. You know, the JAs had been incarcerated, but once they were free, they were free to choose to support the U.S. by serving as interrogators. <laughs> and, but as Sam Miyamoto declared, it wasn't really a choice, right? He was drafted, and other people didn't really have a choice either. It was like the best job, et cetera, et cetera. Others didn't have options. So then the freedom that was supposed to be embedded or say, held sacred in liberalism didn't actually exist in practice. And the choices weren't really free. The consequences for not making the correct free choice could be very severe, uh, as Monica Kim talks about. To choose to deny U.S. claims to universal moralism or benevolence meant that one was, by not choosing the American way, right, meant that one was irrational or a fanatic oriental communist and therefore forfeiting claims for protection of life. Moreover, the Korean POWs on Kolje Island show that the focus on the individual is hardly freeing. They protested having to make a choice about repatriation because it denegated their state sovereignty, that is, to negotiate repatriation. And it was made into an, you know, they had to be weighed with this individual choice, as she says, one with heightened pressures about individual choice. And all this at this time, the struggles about, you know, this is happening like who, in the moment of decolonization, is who is set to, um, you know, who is fit to self rule? And as Monica points out, the struggle is also about the racial order. And as a conflict about the racial order, we have to think about it. In the end, was to think about to think about it as you know who could be disregarded, whose labor, land, and resources would be more exploitable, right? In other words, you know the wealth that could be extracted, profit enjoyed by others. Who you know it's it's about thinking about race in that larger sort of frame. But the lie of liberalism was to show that people were freely choosing. As a wage for worker freely cho choose to work for wages rather than having the ability to support him or himself after enclosures, for instance, right? But then oftentimes, this appeared to have been a lie that U.S. officials themselves believed. I, there's this really great quote that you had that I just have to quote. You know, the, the Psychological Service Board was saying to government officials, the free world, quote, the free world, and ultimately the people not free will become, will welcome American leadership just in the degree that they are genuinely and humbly seeking to help all of humanity. 
So this is what William F. Man Williams called the tragedy of American diplomacy for those of the Schaefer people in here, right? America is so generous. They want to lift up the world to be our kind of like, you know, bring the fruits of modernity and democracy and all of that to everybody. But the tragedy was, of course, the Americans insisted on their way or the, or the higher, you know, it was just like they insisted on their way. And so doing, they undermined the very principle of democracy and self-determination that they were supposedly um, um, trying to promote. Okay, so choice then was a powerful liberal and thus capitalist concept need and ideology. It serves a vindication and publicity in a period when neocolonialism was being instituted. By neocolonialism, which is not a really a great term, <laughs> I'm referring to what predominates in our world today, that is imperialism without colonies, save for the military settler colonies otherwise known as U.S. bases. In the face of decolonization, the U.S. need to have a moral legitimacy to say to put those spaces, as it were, by invitations. Um, I want to end my comments with just a few comments about the, the, um, the Cold War, which began in Korea and still continues in Korea, as maybe a liberal race war. I'm thinking about that more and more. Um, during the Cold War and through the presence, not much have died in disproportionate numbers under the cloak of racial tolerance. At the most, this notion of racial tolerance merely repeated the good non-white from the bad non-white, right? And I was struck by the enforcement of white supremacy by the US POWs that you detail in your seventh chapter. The KKK, the Screaming Eagles, what a strange name, <laughs> Screaming Eagles, you know, they kept up the racial disdain for the Oriental. They, they so-called resisted brainwashing and they maintained a so-called American sense of self-identity which of course means being racist, you know, in a sense too. And um, overall, I just wanna end my comments here by saying this is a really wonderful book. It's just so rich and I hope that many, many people read it and not just people who are interested in Korea because I think it has a lot to tell us about imperialism, colonialism, and racial capitalism. Thank you. Um, I wanna say I am going to make comments too, but um, my, I am a historian not in this field. I don't study Korea. I don't do post-colonialism. Um, and so I come to it, and, and you'll see I come to it sort of describing in a way what I get, got from it as I read it. But I did grow up in the period of the Korean War, which was the vivid background to the domestic Cold War and the McCarthy period that was going on here in the United States. And, and that would be a que if the question I might ask you, although I don't have questions here, <laughs> is how you, how you would link the two. Because I was thinking the period of 1950 to 53 mm -hmm. is the moment of the, of the takeoff of what becomes the McCarthy period. Mm -hmm. And it's going on exactly at the same time as, mm -hmm. as the Korean War. Mm -hmm. But that's just to explain my reading of, of this book. The interrogation rooms of the Korean War is a remarkable accomplishment. I had already been fascinated by Monica's 200, 2013 article in History of the Present, which followed the extraordinary trajectory of Sam Miyamoto to illuminate the experiential side of the Korean War that political histories usually ignore. As she told us tonight, Miyamoto was a Japanese American who spent World War II in an internment camp. He was then exchanged for real Americans in a prisoner of war swap with the Japanese, and then served as an interrogator of POWs for the US during the Korean War. But I was not prepared, having read that article, for the scope of the analysis now offered in the book. Monica, and I am gonna call her Monica. <laughs> I'm not deferring to her <laughs> professorial status. Monica presents what she calls a social micro-history as a way of examining international diplomatic history. She tracks the prehistory of the Korean conflict to establish the legacy of Japanese imperialism, and she explores the way in which the U.S. differently fashioned its own imperial ambitions. The most striking aspect to me was how she locates it all in the context of colonialism. In the era of national liberation movements, the question of what counted as national sovereignty was crucial for formal colonial powers. The ability to wage legitimate war was at the heart of that definition. As she puts it, there was a quandary facing Western nations, quote, to wage war with another entity implied political recognition and its sovereign legitimacy, an event they desired to defer as long as possible in the face of anti-colonial movements. 
surprisingly, the status of prisoners of war was a central aspect of the process. And I really do think that's the surprising uh, part of the book. It, prisoners of war always, I thought, were kind of of uh, secondary to or, or the, the, uh, the byproducts of war. But for her, they are the central uh, characters in, in the process. The interrogation room, Monica writes, was at the crossroads of empire and revolution, the site of conflicting ideological visions of sovereignty between the US, liberal democracy, North Korea, communism, and India, non-alignment in the face of Cold War rivalries. For me, the documentation of the Indian role in these deliberations was also news as I'm sure it may be for many of you who have not studied the conflict closely. It's a measure of what was yielded by Monica's deep research in various archives. Indeed, in her demonstrated mastery of archives and in her linguistic abilities, she established herself as a model historian. But what makes her more than just a conventional historian is her critical stance, her analytic precision, and her ability to sustain her argument through the small details of, every, of everyday life for the individuals whose stories she recounts. And this is, I'm gonna quote this again, it's been quoted before, stories of war, she tells us, hold allegorical power because at their most fundamental, they are stories about intimate encounters. Monica deftly reads the rich ethnographic details of the POW experience in its different forms and sites to document her argument about what a close look at interrogation rooms reveals, how war and intervention are morally justified, how the Korean War was a crucial forum for establishing what counted as a legitimate nation state in the early post-colonial era, how international diplomacy figured in the repatriation process, and how states attempt to form subjects. The question of repatriation, again, as we've been told, loomed large in the treatment of prisoners of war. It was, Monica points out, ultimately about the formation of political subjects. The US defined the interrogation room as a liberal bureaucratic space, in which prisoners were offered the possibility of so-called choice, freedom, the embrace of, the US, of American ideas, or continued subjection to communist ideology. Those who chose to re renounce communism chose freedom. Those who refused would deem the products of indoctrination, whether they were Koreans or Americans, a few of whom chose to stay in, Korea, in North Korea or China. The conversion of loyal communists involved the refinement of psychological warfare a practice that came into its own in these interrogation rooms during the Korean War. Monica's discussion of how the U.S. demand for voluntary repatri repatriation of POWs introduced ideological tests into political negotiations of how that happened is a compelling example of the workings of liberal ideology, as is her analysis of the use of the concept of brainwashing to explain why POWs might not choose American promises of freedom. And I have to say, brainwashing is one of the things in my growing up that I've never forgotten, because I used to try to figure out what it meant. <laughs> Did they take out your brain and wash it? <laughs> um, I was, I was <laughs> around 10 years old at the time. <laughs> and so I had a very literal notion of what brainwashing could possibly mean. But it's an example of the workings of liberal ideology, but also of its limits. There are many instances in which PO, she documents in which POWs refuse to be subjected and instead insist on articulating their own subjectivity, the so-called Dodd kidnapping of an American military man sent to negotiate with protesting POWs is a good example. The story itself is terrific, and there are many terrific stories in this book. How a peaceful protest demanding improved conditions, paper to write on was among them, became an instance of dangerous insubordination. But it also serves Monica's larger purpose to present us with vivid examples of lived experience that defy easy, official, usually binary categorizations. The information gleaned, for, gleaned from memoirs and interviews with GIs who chose to stay in China reveals a great deal about racism, and this is, again, we keep echoing these themes, in the prison camps. There were KKK chapters formed, for example. I found that an astonishing example of just what you talked about, this sort of reproduction of American racism in these kinds of, of conditions. The attention to small details, the reading of their significance, allows her to mount a large argument, not only about the place of the Korean War in the history of the 20th century, but also about the nature of war, violence, and sovereignty in that period as well. This is a large history, and I have to say unusual for a first book, and it suggests the extent of Monica Kim's analytic powers. She can see forests, the global, 
and trees intimate relations and delineate the relationship between them. I want to end on a more personal or nostalgic note. Two sentences in the epilogue struck me particularly forcefully, and this is the first one. This is how the interiority of people became both the terrain and the use ad bellum for warfare in the Korean War. And the second one, the profound intimacy between violence and the language of liberalism lies at the heart of this study. As I read those words, I couldn't help thinking of Marilyn Young, all of whose work was dedicated to reminding us of those facts. Were she with us here today, I'm sure Marilyn would have expressed enormous admiration for this terrific book. It carries on her legacy into a new generation of critical historians. Thank you. Mary. I'll just throw out maybe two mini questions which overlap with the questions that Professor Peck actually raised. Um, the first one is a procedural one on your methodology. Um, this book is full of, um, as you saw from the, the images projected, um, declassified reports. Um, and um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of going through those ledgers and you know, sort of what that looked like on a sort of nitty gritty basis. Um, as a journalist, I was jealous because I thought, like Sam Miyamoto and these other stories, like Professor Scott just mentioned, man, that would be such a good magazine story. Um, <laughs> but it's already been written, so. <laughs> um, my second mini question, or maybe not so many, overlaps with the third question that you raised and um, overlaps with the comments of Professor Shibasawa, which is the afterlife of the Korean War. If we accept this argument, which I think is quite convincing in the book, that um, this is a kind of pivot point in the development of US imperialism and a certain model of US militarism. What are we to make of its connection to the forever wars that have come more into the discourse over the past couple of years? I think as a result of Trump's destabilizing influence around liberalism and diplomacy and sort of what is the accepted notion of what it is to be an American and to you know have a proper government that's functioning. Um, a lot of people in this room are probably young people who have only ever known an America that's at war in Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance. So in talking about those forever wars and this unending war, what is that relationship? Actually, Tammy, I think your question is actually very important about, um, about US wars of intervention and what I feel is um, really coming to the fore, um, having done this research. And, and I think that with, for US wars of intervention, um, that this whole language of um, basically once um, there seems to be a stalemate on the, on the quote unquote battlefield, um, the US administration in a sense has to, rather than crafting a figure of the enemy that's really holding water for the American public, who, who's pretty war weary after World War II and not exactly understanding what's going on, quote unquote, over there in Korea, that's when they turn to the POW and basically create a, quote unquote, figure of rescue, I would say, right? So US wars of intervention with this hallmark of, um, of being benevolent, right? Of, of being waged not in the interest of a state, but actually on behalf of humanity in order to intervene for a particular kind of individual subject. Um, so that is one hallmark that I definitely see. Uh, but with um, talking about, about Trump and um, fascism, uh, or I'm, I'm gonna talk about fascism, um, <laughs> is that the other thing that was really critical, and I think it comes more out in the epilogue, um, where um, I was concerned that in some ways that to be tracking um, the interrogation room, what also, what might get lost in the frame was the incredible violence, especially in terms of bombings um, done by the United States. And so that during the war, um, you know, General MacArthur wanted to basically um, create a radioactive cobalt belt, he called it, um, by you know, detonating nuclear bombs all along the Yalu River. Um, and he's like, oh, and it'll just stay radioactive for about like 75 years, and that, that'll be adequate, right? Um, so that was a possibility. And then um, in terms of the amount of um, bombing, uh, of like the tonnage of bombs that were dropped in Korea during, um, from 1950 to 1953, it actually exceeds the amount of the tonnage of bombs that were dropped in the entire Asia Pacific theater um, for the duration of World War II. And same goes for napalm also. So um, what I had discovered was that um, 
this discussion about uh, the POW and this idea about free choice, et cetera, et cetera. This is um, being developed right in hand with um, the bombing programs um, that, were, that were being created. So for example, um, the very same uh, board, the Psychological Strategy Board, that came up with this proposal around the US POW, they were also the ones who created um, this kind of pre-bombing leaflet, bomb, like leaflet um, uh, campaign. So you drop leaflets um, across North Korean civilian sites before you bomb, and so you know if they're still there when you're when you bomb, then clearly they've chosen to stay, and if they chose to stay, they must be the bad guys, anyways, right? So it's it's this. Um, so I guess what I'm I'm trying to get at is that the um, the the liberal discourse, right, um, is actually facilitating um, a fascistic right um, system in terms of uh, infrastructures of, of violence. Um, and the process question around the archives? Yes, yeah, so I, maybe I can combine that with um, about, about narrative and, um, and writing. So, um, oof. <laughs> the archives are incredibly challenging. Um, there's no mention um, within the US military archives about Japanese American interrogators. Um, there's, that completely happened because of oral history interviews. Um, the, uh, it, I, I filed Freedom of Information Acts um, as if I was a machine, because <laughs> I had to beat a machine, basically, in terms of uh, getting access. So um, the, the files which, um, so regarding the North Korean and Chinese POW camps, it took nine years for those to get declassified for me. And those are over a thousand interrogation case files done by the US military um, of US POWs returning from um, North Korean and Chinese POW camps about their experiences of interrogation. So that was difficult also. Um, and then all about, um, and that also raised another question, which was that um, how do I how do I tell this story where I'm I'm starting from um, these different projects, let's say, of these interrogation rooms, and I'm I'm saying that in one of my arguments is that there is a violence in terms of bureaucracy, right? There's a certain kind of bureaucracy that is being created and its logic both facilitates a kind of violence but also enacts a kind of violence, right? And here I am also <laughs> writing on paper, right? And, and, and so one of the things I'm doing is I'm literally following paper, paper trails um, and POWs themselves um, are also hiding paper. I mean, it, paper is, a, is an actual a very alive character in a lot of ways to, to illustrate the stakes of what's happening on the ground. So I, I did very much choose to leave certain stories out. And uh, one, um, I guess I can say this in more abstracted um, terms, but one thing that I did realize while I was doing oral history um, interviews uh, with South Korean former prisoners of war was that the story would change. And I do not believe that it's because they are quote unquote unreliable narrators. I believe that it's actually the changing of the story that is the story, mm -hmm. right? The changing of the story is, um, is the legacy of the war. The changing of the story is a way to survive an ongoing war because if you change the story, no one can necessarily pinpoint you as you know discreetly communist or anti-communist, which had huge stakes in terms of life or death on the Korean Peninsula. So, um, but in terms of being able to, um, so things like that, I decided n not to place into um, the book because I wasn't entirely sure if my own narrative would be able to hold that in a way. Um, I was also very concerned about ways that um, my material and my research could be quoted um, and, and used in ways that um, I would not have control over. So I, I did not want to put at risk that particular um, interviewee um, by, by having that story in there. So, so yes, there are actually yeah, many cases of that. We have a question from the audience about the 
identity construction of the Japanese American interrogators. And I'm wondering if I could pose this both to Professor Kim and Professor Shibasawa, given your book, um, which is how did the interrogation room interviews conducted by those Japanese Americans construct new identities or shift their identities for them? So maybe speaking to that interrogation room and then Professor Shibasawa, if you wanted to add to that in terms of how they sort of that identity was constructed um, in America, if not for these particular interrogators, just for Japanese Americans generally affected by internment. So um, with Sam Miyamoto and Joan mentioned kind of his extraordinary um, uh, life story. Um, Sam Miyamoto, um, after he, when he was interned in post in Arizona in the internment camp, um, because at that point, um, Japan, when US was entering the war at that point, Japan already um, had taken basically prisoner or civ as civilian internees um, over 200 US missionaries, journalists, and businessmen, all of whom were white. And they didn't have any Japanese people to exchange. So they turn to the Japanese American internment camps. And so Sam becomes one of the um, Japanese American internees who are then um, swapped, basically, one-to-one uh, -one for <laughs> white Americans at Goa. Goa because it was an, a Portuguese colony and therefore neutral. Um, and then he is brought over to Japan where he's never been before. He didn't even speak Japanese at that point. Um, and as he's there, um, because his father had, had not registered him in their village uh, registry, he also was not a recognized subject of the Japanese empire. He couldn't go to public schools and he couldn't go to hospitals either, right? So he survives by bartering English lessons at a Catholic school. Um, and then eventually goes to the US, uh, goes to UCLA, wants to study law, big surprise. Um, and, but the only place he could go to study law was at UC Berkeley. So basically, in that one month, one month of transfer, that's when he got drafted for the Korean War. And what Sam told me, um, I mean, Sam, he's, he's now passed away, um, but it was some of the most remarkable thing. Uh, so he, he was like a theorist <laughs> of colonial power, basically, you know? I mean, it's, that's basically what I feel like I had learned from him from over 20 hours of conversation. Where, um, and I have a quote from him in the book where he says, you had to know history to survive. So the way that he actually um, deals with interrogation of um, Korean um, communist POWs is that he, he reveals to them that he basically understands like their history, right? Um, and I can there's much more on that in in the book, but I, I think that um, it becomes suddenly. I mean, it's not necessarily completely upturning the ultimate power positions that are happening in the interrogation room. Um, but there is something very important, I think, about Sam Miyamoto's need to actually say that he has a history <laughs> that is incredibly complicated, that doesn't work with, um, with the US military, right? It's kind of hard to say in a sense, you know? I mean, on one hand, I was kind of wondering about like Sam's quote as well too, is that that's also a story that could have shifted, right? Mm -hmm. Right, that this is like something that he had to say at the time, even though he's not, you know, yeah. right? He, he could say that to the Korean, right? And he also was very clever in the ways in which he interrogated the Koreans, right? He, you know, made it sound like he understood their point of view and all this other stuff, spoke in Japanese to show that he could speak Japanese, you know, th and then in a ways in which it sort of shows sympathy and yet was able to try to do the liberal project in a sense, right? And so even though he's critical of what happened to him, on their hand, even though he was drafted, he wasn't there by choice, he was also still serving the state, right? And so afterwards, he can come out and say, this was kind of like messed up a little bit, and he can be a critic for colonialism. But at that time, he had to do what he had to do, right? And also, I, I don't think I can generalize about Japanese Americans overall, because it's just a variety of ways in which people reacted, right? And there's a whole bunch of Japanese Americans of this gener of Sam's generation who became like rah rah, 200% Americans because of their camp experience, right? And so that's sort of a generational sort of shift. So I think Sam is fascinating for the, you know, the sort of critical insight that he had. We have two questions about gender in your book, um, kind of specific ones about were there women POWs that you located, um, but also just about kind of 
gender in the Korean War, if you had any comments about that. Also a compliment about having an all-woman panel. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in terms of the, well, it's a, always an important question. The Among Korean POWs, um, there weren't many women, but there were some. And um, Joan also mentioned, you gave such a good overview of the book. Um, Joan mentioned the something called the Dodd kidnapping that happened where um, basically five uh, Korean communist POWs um, very, very calmly, actually, <laughs> peacefully, yes, um, uh, kind of escort and kidnap the um, US camp commander of the largest POW camp that was under US um, aegis. So it was over 170,000 um, POWs at this camp. And um, they kidnap him, but they don't actually ever um, usurp his command. And that's because they're really, they were really using their position as POWs to make a kind of argument. So the POWs created um, a kind of representative group um, of, I think it was about um, 32 POWs. And when you read their bios that come through from um, the post-incident interrogations, you can tell that quite a few of them had been involved in the anti-colonial movement. Right? Right? Um, and not only that, there are um, three, ver three young women who are actually part of that representative group. What's also interesting is all three young women are from South Korea. Um, and they are all, um, they had joined um, the North Korean army um, as, as nurses. Um, but they are also part of this kind of uh, representative group. And so these POWs are basically, um, asking this camp commander to, to um, recognize them as a representative group because then uh, at the same time, um, the US and the UN would then not be able to completely deny uh, sovereign recognition of North Korea, right? So they're, they're using that very um, strategically. Also, gender is very important, especially in thinking about the US POWs and the North Korean and Chinese camps. And that's because, um, for example, um, the, um, so in that chapter, um, there's no way to talk about what's happening with uh, the US POWs in the North Korean and Chinese camps and how they then later narrate that to US military interrogators without talking about masculinity, right? So um, that, that's hugely important. And in fact, um, the kind of McCarthyism that's happening in the US at that same time. I think for me, what was very important about um, reading this brainwashing story against, well, not even just against the grain, I kind of wanted to put it in a bin and put it on fire. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, often the brainwashing story is um, portrayed as kind of a, a mass hysteria of, like, of McCarthyism. It's like all these Americans just like lose their minds, right? And I make this argument that it's, well, maybe they're losing their minds, but they're not losing their minds for no reason. It's because US military are so anxious, basically, about this kind of North Korean project that becomes apparent in the interrogation rooms about decolonizing um, the, the American. And I, I so this, these are the books that were in the POW camp um, in North Korea. And these are the books that are available <laughs> um, for the US POWs. For, and these are from working class. Um, they were African American, Filipino, Puerto Rican, right? And it turns out that the North Korean and Chinese interrogators themselves, they had studied um, in American universities. They knew Philadelphia, they knew Chicago, they knew Los Angeles, and they knew race relations, right? Um, and so here you have the US on one hand scrambling and bringing in Japanese Americans to be the interrogators. And it turns out that in terms of the long game strategy, <laughs> that, um, that the North Koreans especially um, were, were really um, in, the, in the interrogation room, um, again, an attempt to kind of offer an internationalist kind of relationship um, and a, a project of decolonizing the POW. Sure. Um, let's just do one last question. Um, it's a question about if you could expand a little bit on what you were saying about free will and choice. Mm -hmm. 
and how that was developed as a kind of strategy of US imperialism mm -hmm. in the Korean War. Yeah, so the story, yeah, that's such an important question for the book. Uh, so when the US um, presents this uh, proposal of voluntary repatriation, what it ended up doing was naturalizing the 38th parallel, and this is what I mean. So this idea that South Koreans or North Koreans, that they, they can just choose where they go. Um, number one, for the US, they were hoping for a lot of Koreans to then be choosing South Korea, because then that would essentially be saying that the US project of quote unquote decolonization in South Korea was complete and also was a success. That actually did not happen in terms of numbers um, at the end of um, the signing of the ceasefire. Um, but also what it did was that it completely uh, alighted that, um, that there were members in the North Korean army who were originally from the South um, the U.S. also had a policy after China entered the war of rounding up entire villages um, and putting them behind um, the POW camps. Um, there were also instance, many instances, actually, of South Korean soldiers being captured by North Korean troops. And then when those North Korean troops surrendered to U.S. military, the U.S. military was like, well, we can't really figure out the difference. So all of you are now going to be POWs, right? So it's, it's, it was just this, this whole idea of a choice and this whole idea that this was going to be about free will um, was yet again, even during the war, a way to kind of naturalize like the 30th parallel and also to you know, make finite or, or um, say that you know, you, the US was successful in terms of the South Korean occupation. And we'd like to thank all of the panelists again, and especially Monica Kim for this wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.